Now, despite the onset of short, dark days and increasingly colder temperatures, some of my greenhouse plants are growing more strongly than they've grown all year. Why is that? I hear you collectively shriek. Let's find out. And we are in. OK, so just over a month ago, I started doing something in here that I've never done in a greenhouse in over 30 years of greenhouse growing. It's not what you're thinking, but I'm open to offers. So today we're going to look around at all this new growth and discuss what's happened and whether this thing I've done is the real cause. And so we'll begin with exhibit number one, the Bougainvillea. Well, OK, perhaps it doesn't look quite as good as this one, but you've got to remember that I live in the north of England underneath heavy shade and have mostly dull and predominantly cold conditions, especially in December. So this is my version. Let's get a Bougainvillea, I thought to myself. They love uh, bright light, sunny warm conditions. I'm sure you've all been there. And the consequences of my pretty dumb decision? Well, of course, it's struggled since day one. But not necessarily for the reasons that you might first think. It was only this year that I discovered it was mainly spider mites that have been confining it to it, like this repeated cycle of new growth, increased in spider mite population, plant ejects leaves, back to the new growth, and so on over and over and over. Spraying it with systemics has helped, but as many of you are no doubt aware, over time, greenhouse spider mites become resistant to most insecticides. So you find that you get more and more mites, and the shorter and shorter time intervals in between being without them. So within days of using this thing I'm talking about, and despite the late season when this plant should be shedding its leaves for winter, it began to bloom. Now I'm fully aware that this isn't a specimen that will win any cultural prizes or impress anyone south of Watford, but it's a positive start and it bodes well for the next growing season. So on to exhibit number two, my impatiens. I've got two impatiens here, and perhaps the biggest surprises in the new strong growth are these two, purchased over nine months ago as very small plug plants. Sure, they've bloomed on and off, but have always looked sickly and washed out as though they had spider mites off thrips, which in fact my handy hand lens confirmed earlier in the summer that they did in fact have both. But this is where it gets interesting. You see, despite not seeing a thing in terms of pests on it for months, the plants still appeared to be ailing and were growing. So after some research, it appears that not all mites are visible, even with a hand lens. Some sap sucking mites and tarsonomid mites are one, sometimes called broad mites, can't be seen without the aid of a microscope. So tarsonomid mites are very often called cyclamen mites too, can in fact infect many plants. Is it possible that they were infested with tarsonomid mites? I've definitely had them on cyclamen before, which up until recently were located just a couple of feet away from these plants. So there's no doubt that they've grown very, very quickly in the few weeks since I started using the thing I'm not yet telling you, but you've probably guessed. In fact, they've almost doubled in size during that period. But they're not the only plants to put on a lot of growth in the last month. See exhibit three, Tredescantia down here, see. These Tredescantia have also grown really rapidly. Here we've got a couple of Zebrina varieties and a Maiden's Blush. And just to go off slightly on a tangent here, as I'm often inclined to do, much to the annoyance of many viewers who are in such a rush that they can barely watch five seconds of a video before needing to start a new one, but I digress from my digression, the Tredescantia Maiden's Blush, sometimes incorrectly known as Tredescantia Blushing Bride, tends to be triggered into growth by a change in temperatures and or day length, hence the lovely new pink growth on these. Still on exhibit number three, and there are several exhibit number threes, all Tredescantia, Tredescantia Mundula Lisa. So this was sold to me as Tredescantia Tricolor Minima, but more correctly, it should be Tredescantia Mundula Lisa. These have also started growing only since using the magic thing, as I'm now calling it, None of these showed any signs of visible pests through the hand lens, yet they're all growing again and looking healthier since I started with the magic thing. And this sudden change has occurred in the greenhouse in many other plants you're going to see today. Behold exhibit number four. These Phragmopediums are both about to bloom and have new clean growth without any black marks as on the older leaves. The Phragmopedium bessii has been in limbo for most of this year until the magic thing came along. And now for some new evidence that really demonstrates the crux of what I'm slowly getting at, exhibit number five. 
Terris Quadriorita, and it's gone huge. It's throwing out lovely new coppery fronds, and I think it didn't have mites of any description, yet it's growing more strongly than before. Now, it could simply be the cooler temperatures in the case of the fern, but I'm not convinced that's the only reason. It could have had teeny tiny mites that I couldn't see, but the fact that it's never really stopped growing lends me to think it didn't have any pests at all. It's only really started growing so strongly since the thing came along. And so, ladies and gents, exhibit number six, asparagus fern. The asparagus fern has also suddenly sprouted a couple of new growths after, again, being in limbo for months. No real evidence of pests, just very slow growth over the summer and then this. Which brings me to exhibits seven and eight. The Cymbidium, about to flower in December. The Brugmansia, well, you get the idea. Both in bloom, both looking really, really healthy. Well, compared to what they were previously. So I think it's time for the big reveal here, or non-reveal if you've already guessed it. I think the cause of this new growth is the Sulphur Hotbox but possibly not in the way that you think. You see, there could be two things going on here. Firstly, it may just be observed evidence, nothing conclusive, but it seems likely to me that the sulfur has killed more than just the spider mites and thrips. Possibly other microscopic mites have been seen off too. Pests that I didn't know I had, and that's huge. But secondly, and here's the really, really interesting part, I did a bit of reading, always dangerous, and it appears that sulfur is considered to be an essential plant nutrient, right after nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the NPK that's found on all plant fertilizer labels. Some sources even called it the fourth major plant nutrient. And while plants take most of their sulfur in through their roots, they can also, I believe, to a smaller extent, take it in through their leaves in the form of sulfur dioxide, something produced, yes, you guessed it, by the sulfur hotbox. So could it be that in addition to killing off my visible and invisible pests and fungal spread, which we've not even mentioned yet, the sulfur is also providing a little kick of fertilizer too. It sounds almost too good to be true, doesn't it? Sulfur killing all manner of pests, killing all fungal diseases and stopping their spread and providing some fertilizer into the bargain. So why isn't everyone using it? No idea. Well, possibly because it's not quite as easy to live with sulfur fumes in the house. But honestly, the worst time was the first time. And after that, I hardly noticed the smell at all. And it soon dissipates after a few hours, especially if you open the windows. I don't think I could tolerate it in the living room on a daily basis, but conservatory or a dedicated grow room would be no problem for me. The thing isn't actually running 24 seven all year round. Of course, many commercial growers are already using it and sulfur is readily available as a fertilizer on its own without melting it as I'm doing. It's worth pointing out though, that I'm merely speculating here. The hot box manufacturers don't claim that it acts as a fertilizer. So don't go rushing out applying sulfur to all your plants with gay abandon as you can overdo it, like with other fertilizers. But there's little chance of overdoing it with a hot box, providing you follow the manufacturer's directions, as plants only take a small fraction of their sulfur needs through their leaves. But I do wonder if it's helped my plants get a little boost this autumn. Sulfur really does, so far at least, appear to be a magic cure-all. There are other plants in here that also appear to be benefiting, but we'll save those for another video. So in conclusion, I'm very happy with the sulfur so far. Is it a magical cure-all? Probably not. The growth I'm seeing could simply be a response to having no more sap-sucking pests to fight against, but it's a tempting theory to think that the sulphur could also be providing a little nutrient boost too. As you can see, the results so far appear to be beyond expectations. So if you haven't already seen it as to how this thing works, and no, I'm not selling them, I just want to help fellow growers, this video up here tells you all about it. I'll see you on the next one. Bye.